Our second service Trip on the drive and park, I guess today we'll call it. I called Trip it the lawn and drive last time, so we'll uh, call it the lawn and the park today. I hope you enjoy our sound system. This is actually our new sound system. Last time we were using a borrowed one, um, and it's apparently a pretty good one because everybody's giving thumbs up. And when I was making a quick dash uh, to the restrooms to wash my hands before we got started, I could hear us in there, you know, and of course it's behind, so these are nice unidirectional speakers, so we're in good shape. Today is 
All Saints Sunday, observed by many faith traditions, and I'll talk more about that during our time of recognition in a little while. Um, but what that means specifically depends on your faith tradition and depends even on your individual church because a lot of different uh, churches and faith traditions look at it differently. Sometimes there's true theological differences and sometimes it's just customary differences. I very honestly have no idea what, if anything, Trinity has ever done for All Saints Sunday. I know we've not done anything in the time that I've been here before today, but I do welcome you to our All Saints Day service. I thought it would be appropriate, given the fact that it's all Sunday falls on November the 1st, and as I'll mention more later, I think it's appropriate given the era that we live in right now. So, I'm glad to see you. I hope you're as excited about, again, being back together as I am. And I'm going to go ahead and step out on a faith limb and say that you can plan right now, if you don't hear differently, that we will again meet in person next Sunday at 1030. Likely right here. Uh, because the weather's supposed to be even better uh, than today, a little sunnier, a little warmer. Uh, but uh, we'll, we'll see, uh, once we talk to everybody and see how things go, exactly what our plans are. But I believe we, we can plan on meeting again uh, next week in person. And now, join me as we worship our Lord and... Start with a congregational call to worship reprinted in your bulletin. I will read the light type and ask you to join me with the bold. People from all times and places, God calls us to worship and share together this mystery of life and faith and love. In the company of those well-known and little-known, God invites us to journey together along this way of mystery, for our Lord is our way, the truth, and the life. We stand, everybody, and let's sing. We have come into his house, even in the parking lot. <laughs> it's everywhere. surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely, 
and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who, for the sake of the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such hostility against himself from sinners, so that you may not grow weary or lose heart. This is the word of God for the people of God. diminish those faith traditions that recognize saints beyond the typical follower of Christ, but today throughout this service, as well as during my message, we'll be using saints to talk about Christians. We're in the midst of saints today. Look to the person next to you, behind you, in front of you, and you're looking at a saint. But as we will talk more about during the sermon, there's a cloud of witnesses that we can't see who also are here with us. The saints who have gone before us, as Alex just read, the cloud of witnesses 
of those who have gone before. And the writer of Hebrews in the preceding chapter goes through what we call the Faith Hall of Fame, starting with Abel and going through many heroes of the faith, the saints who have gone before who are with us as witnesses. And so today we recognize those who have gone before. I've heard All Saints Day called Christian Memorial Day. And so I think that's a way that we can tend to think about it, but we'll expand it a little bit to also call it Christian Veterans Day to recognize those of us who are still here as well. Carolyn asked me to read a recognition, and I think that it fits this idea of recognizing saints, if you'll allow me to use the word a little looser now, because certainly teachers are saints, aren't they? Think about the teachers that put up, or I think about the teachers that put up with me in my education days. Perhaps you don't fall into that category, but if you do, you know exactly what I mean. I know we have some teachers here in our congregation, and you probably sometimes felt like saints, and probably there were a few times you felt like somebody else, too, when you had to deal with some of the children. But in recognition of that, today has been declared by the governor of Georgia, Georgia Retired Educators Day. And it, this recognition says, whereas there are more than 135,000 retired educators in Georgia, 31,000 plus of whom are members of the Georgia Retired Educators Association, and whereas the retired educators of Georgia donate thousands of hours of community service and make invaluable contributions to the welfare of their respective communities across the state, and whereas it's appropriate that a day be designated for citizens to, us to express their appreciation for the contributions that retired educators have made and continue to make for the betterment of human lives and society, and whereas local houses of worship will recognize those lasting contributions made by retired educators in this community now, herefore presented to the congregation of Trinity Baptist Church by the Decatur DeKalb Retired Educators, a local unit of the Georgia Retired Educators Association, do proclaim the day of November the 1st as All Saints and Retired Educators Day. <laughs> I edited that slightly, <laughs> and encourage members of the local community to recognize and honor the retired educators in our midst. <coughs> Others that we wish to recognize, and this is traditional in many Protestant congregations that observe All Saints Day, and I won't get into all of the history and so forth of the days, but also recognize November the 2nd is All Souls Day, which again has different things, but most Protestant congregations kind of lump the two together and frequently use it as a time to memorialize or recognize those who have gone in the last year, the last 12 months. So I'm going to recognize those that I'm aware of that we have lost in our extended Trinity family which I have kind of defined as our Trinity family and immediate family members of our Trinity family because we have not had, thankfully, any actual Trinity members or attenders pass away this year. I will mention Bill Lee, who's just a little over the 12-month uh, mark, and mention him because he'll fit in somewhat with the sermon as well. But... Let us remember Catherine Beam, Karen's mom, Charles Loftus, Delinda's dad, Janice Redfern, Carolyn's sister-in-law, Canangela's father, Sandy Burbridge's brother, Ron Smith, 
Jan McRae, Deborah's sister-in-law, Cherie Cole, mine and Barbara's sister-in-law, and also Lad lost his aunt this past year. Those in our congregation that y'all have made me aware of that have gone to glory from the church militant or the church present to the church triumphant in years past include Bill, who I just mentioned, Bob Collins, Joyce's husband, Stuart Collins, Joyce's son, and I would like to just take a moment to allow you, if you wish, to state the name of a loved one of yours you wish for us to remember today who's gone before us. And then, as we close out our recognition of those who've gone before, it's appropriate that we remember the many whom we've lost during 2020 because of the pandemic. In Georgia, as of yesterday, it was just less than 8,000 lives lost. 7,979. Nationwide, nearly 230,000 deaths from COVID-19. The first death in Georgia was a 67-year-old patient hospitalized at Wellstar Kennestone who tested positive on March the 7th. There is an organization here in Georgia that seeks to recognize those who are lost, and I think their name brings to mind what I think of when I think of those lost to COVID-19, which are loved ones, not numbers because we're inundated by the news media just by the sheer circumstance that we find ourselves in with numbers, numbers of positives, numbers of deaths, positivity rates, numbers of hospitalizations, but what we sometimes forget is that every single one of those people is precious to God and precious to a number of people here. And we should remember that, that they are loved ones, not numbers. And I'm going to go ahead and risk my job and do something that is not particularly easy for us as Baptists to do, but to exercise an extended moment of silence. I've got my watch, stopwatch timer here, and I'm going to ask that we recognize an 80 second, that's one minute and 20 seconds, moment of silence, one second for every 100 lives lost to COVID-19 in Georgia. Join me now as we remember those lives lost.
Thank you. Those 80 seconds were to commemorate those lives lost in Georgia, but if averages continue to hold, one more person has passed from COVID-19 during that moment of silence in the United States. And now let's continue with our worship of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We stand for our doxology. Some new, some continuing. Here are a few from this week's prayer list. Melissa and Dustin as they prepare for the arrival of baby Jack. Delinda's family as they continue to mourn the loss of her father. Kelly Dixon as she makes some adjustments to her professional life and her career path. Oren Morris as he ministers to the many residents of the retreat all of our teachers and students who are still trying to navigate the school year under the most unusual and difficult of circumstances. All of our friends and family who are in senior living facilities and isolated from the rest of the world and those they love, and everyone who was impacted by the storms this week, many of whom are still without power and many who are just beginning to assess the damage to their homes and their businesses. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, thank you for your love and your constant care. We pray that this new month brings us some good moments and a sense of peace and comfort. We love you, Lord. Thank you that you are far greater than anything we face in this life. And we have to overcome because you have set us free. We thank you for your truth that no weapon formed against you will prosper. Lord, we ask for your peace, for your protection to surround us and carry us through the most difficult of days. We trust you for your constant work on our behalf. We ask you to bring justice and extend mercy. We ask that you bring light to our dark world. Thank you for the power of your presence living in us and through us. Thank you that you go before us and you cover us from behind. May your name be glorified in our lives as you are building greatness through the heat of these most difficult times. We ask you to be with all of those mentioned earlier, students and teachers, those who were recovering from the damage caused by recent storms, seniors who were in various levels of isolation, Melissa and Dustin, Kelly Dixon, the Loftus family. We ask you to surround us with your love, peace, and hope in the days ahead. Now together, let us join the countless numbers across the centuries who have prayed as our Lord instructed us to pray. Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We stand for our next hymn of expectation. Open our eyes. <laughs> And what we will be has not yet been made known, but we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. All who have this hope in Him purify themselves just as He is pure. This is the Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. We could just about end our service at this moment. We've heard God's Word read to us in two passages, and Canangela saying what in one sense is, is the overall theme of today's service of let there be peace on earth as we are brothers and sisters in Christ as John just told his readers, because we are children of God. God's love invades our lives, gives us individual peace, and then as children of God, we spread peace to those around us. But y'all probably know me better than that, and know that I have a few more things that we will say. And I've titled the sermon today as the beginning of our season of being thankful, of gratitude. I've entitled it, Thankful for Eternal Anchors. And we're using anchors as a metaphor for stability, for giving us grounding and mooring, not for baggage or things holding us back. And in coming weeks, we will look at God willing, thankful for country next Sunday, followed by thankful for Trinity, followed by thankful for one another. Again, around this idea of being God's children. One thing that I learned last service outdoors is that I'm a little limited in my being able to move around. Limited by the mics in front of me, but 
mostly limited, as you maybe just saw, to keep any notes from falling away or flying away. I have to kind of hold them down. But I also like Lad's pulpit that he gave us. I think actually gave to the younger people in the congregation for something they could be behind, but it doesn't separate me from you as much as our more traditional pulpits do. And so I don't feel quite as restricted, even though I can't run around as much as maybe I normally do. But 2020 may have started like most other years, the beginning of a new decade, new challenges, new opportunities. But as we sit here today in the beginning of the next to the last month of 2020, all that has been disrupted and changed. Now we are looking for anchors, for moorings, wherever we can find them. It probably started in January, February, into March with our pandemic and the disruptions financially and personally that, that caused. But we've seen cries for justice on behalf of African Americans and other persons of color in our nation. And that has disrupted our status quo. We're in the midst, indeed, the close of an election season that has left many of us feeling unmoored or uncertain of what the future may bring. We've lost connection to loved ones that we can't travel to see or can't even see if they're in the same community, perhaps. Friends that we can't be with or hug or share meals with. Many of us have lost jobs or at least lost financial security. We don't have normal, in quotes, interaction on our jobs. We can't come together the way that we're used to, sharing lunch in a lunch room or even sometimes working in the same building. Our worship gatherings and other in-person faith experiences have been restricted Recreational opportunities like the Braves games or other sporting events, inside restaurant dining, all of these things we have lost or at least have been drastically changed. Milestone celebrations, weddings, births, deaths that we've experienced. We have not been able to engage in ritual the way that we have before. Our lives have been upended, and we have to acknowledge that life as we knew it is gone. Whatever comes after now is going to be a different world, a different time, a new way of living, but we don't know exactly what that is going to look like. The early Christians in today's scripture lesson felt unmoored too. They were in the midst of church disputes. We might call it a church split. The Johannine or John community of believers were going through at the time. They also had been thrown out of the Jewish synagogues. The early Christians tended to meet in their local Jewish place of worship, the synagogue. But by the time that John was writing his epistle that I just read from, the Christians had been thrown out by and large by the Pharisees. So they were unmoored. They had lost their spiritual anchors. God assured them and God assures us that as Jesus followers, we are God's children. And that is what we need to be and to recognize. We are God's children through God's love. 
We don't deserve it. We don't earn it. But God in God's love calls us to be God's children. We are brothers and sisters together through that love. And as our first scripture reading said, and I've already alluded to in talking about All Saints Day, we're surrounded by a cloud of witnesses, the writer of Hebrews tells us, those who have gone before in the faith. And I'm going to tell you, I don't understand exactly what God meant when God gave us those words about the cloud of witnesses. I'll stick one theological truth in that our loved ones don't go to heaven to become angels. Angels are different heavenly beings. We maintain our individuality in heaven, I believe, but I don't know what spiritual bodies look like. I don't know exactly what they can see of us, but the writer of Hebrews in God's holy word says there are a cloud of witnesses. They are here with us, and we need to be aware of them because they can be among our eternal anchors. In times of trouble now, we can cling to the faith of our forebearers. Faith going back to the fathers and mothers of our faith, Abraham and Sarah and all of those that the writer mentions in Hebrews 12. But most of all, the anchor we can cling to is Jesus Christ, the perfect example of God's love that makes us all children. And we can cling to the anchor of the saints in today's world, those that I asked you earlier to look around and see right here. We are also among that cloud of witnesses the writer of Hebrews is talking about. The present reality is that they, we, and those to come all form together the foundation for our future hope. The hope that we have in Jesus Christ, our eternal anchor. We are suffering now. We feel unsteady now. Indeed, as followers of Christ, we can at times be called to suffer. We are called to suffer because the world does not know Jesus Christ. We are called to be different. We are called to love in a way the world does not understand. And so we will be outsiders to that world just as Jesus was outsiders. And I'm not talking about perceived slights on us as Bible thumpers or whatever maybe we think that we are called at times. I'm talking about a lifestyle that is different. We are not called, indeed we are called to be the anti or the opposite of a greedy, selfish, self-centered lifestyle. We in America have many things to be proud of, but one that I don't think is included is our super rugged, excessive individualism. That's deadly. It nearly killed me, literally, trying to live everything on my own. And when I failed, drinking at it. That's the world that doesn't know Jesus. We know Jesus and Jesus' love, and we are the family of God together, and we can share that with the world in need. We can share that hope, that hope of being members of God's family. Not individuals, but together. That's what our scripture passages today remind us. 
That's what our observation of all those who have gone before reminds us of. And I like the image that I read some people talking about this All Saints Day idea and in particular the Hebrews passage of those who had gone before as thinking of life or really the passage of history as a relay race. Those who have gone before set the foundation of our faith and then handed the baton to us and we are now jointly as a team, as God's family, carrying the baton of faith forward to pass it to the next generation. We're in a tough spot right now. We're in a spot that is difficult to understand because we're living in the now, but we're looking forward to the not yet. There's the hope that when Jesus comes again, we will all be perfected by the author of our faith, Jesus Christ. But we're not there yet. We're not there as individuals. We're not there as a church individually. We're not there as a church collectively. And certainly the world is not there yet. So. We're living in the now with the assurance that we are children of God through God's love, yet we're not all there yet. And that's the struggle we live in. We're trying to navigate this world that doesn't know Jesus, but let's cling together, cling in knowing God's love that calls us to be God's children and assures us that we are God's children. The glue that holds us together is God's love. Let's cling to that. We are God's children now already as we sit here at 301 Honey Creek and call ourselves the 301 Community and Trinity Baptist Church. We don't know what the not yet holds for us. And very frankly, it's challenging. We're sitting outside rather than in our beautiful sanctuary. We face potential financial challenges, but what we can be assured of, what we have as an eternal anchor is that God is with us. And as long as we stay with God's calling and rely on one another as God's children and God's family, we can spread the peace that Canangelo sang about. We often think, of course, about peace as the absence of conflict and really good use of the word peace, but the peace that God gives goes beyond that. It's the internal peace brought about by God with us in the midst of conflicts around us. God being with us in the storm, even if God doesn't remove the storm from our lives. We don't have to wait till we have more dollars. We don't have to wait till we have more members or any other resource you think about to be God's church here in Rockdale County and Conyers, Georgia. Like the readers of First John, all of us gathered here today in person and online can draw strength as we remember that God has already given us all that we need to do to answer God's call to be God's people because through God's love we are His children. Right here, right now, and today. We are in God's family, past, present, and future. Join me in prayer. Father God, we love you and we thank you for the gift of your love, especially the gift of your love through your Son, Jesus Christ, who allows each of us to be brothers and sisters, members of your family that goes back to the very beginning of time and will continue 
past the end of time as we know it. Thank you for Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. God with skin on around us. And while it is wonderful to know that we are God's family, even when we're apart, it's nice to know that we have family members we can see. And so thank you for being here. Thank you for keeping us all safe. And I just ask that we continue to as much as we might love to, let's not go running to one another and hugging and kissing and all those things. We'll delay that for another day. Also, if uh, you were not aware, we do have an offering basket over on the table uh, by the tent uh, with the hand sanitizer and the bulletins that you can uh, give your tithes and offerings. We are probably, for the foreseeable future, not going to be passing plates and that sort of thing. Out here, the checks might blow away, but uh, it's not uh, the, the greatest idea anyway. And as I mentioned, let's plan on regathering next week. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, we'll, we'll regather here next week. And in the meantime, let's remember the words of Jesus Christ on the night that he was arrested and betrayed, the night before he went to the glory of the cross, and that God, the glory that God had for him. And as he reminded the eleven in front of him, and reminds us today, in this world you will have trouble. But take heart. I have overcome the world. Go with God's peace.